The paradox of holding on and letting go, when to grip and when to slip. Struggling with the decision to hold on or let go? Discover the nuanced factors that can make or break your choice. Welcome back, dear listeners, to another episode of Information for Life, insights and ideas to navigate your world. Today, we're diving into a topic that's as slippery as a fish and as gripping as a vise, the paradox of holding on and letting go. The eternal tug of war between persistence and surrender. We've all heard the saying, sometimes holding on does more damage than letting go, a sentiment that often resonates with those who have had the misfortune to find themselves in truly toxic relationships. But is it that simple? Let's unravel this tangled yarn, shall we? Context matters. Context, that ever-elusive chameleon that changes the color of every situation. It's not just the backdrop, it's the director, the scriptwriter, and sometimes even the lead actor in the drama of our decisions. Imagine you're at a crossroads and the signposts are written in a language you don't understand. That's what making a decision without considering context is like. Let's dig a little deeper. Gross and Thompson in 2007 talk about emotion regulation, which is essentially the art of managing your emotional responses based on the situation at hand. Now apply this to the concept of holding on or letting go. Your emotional response to a challenging situation could either be a knee-jerk reaction or a well-thought-out strategy. The context dictates which is more appropriate. Are you in a toxic relationship, or are you just hitting a rough patch that requires some emotional heavy lifting? The context will guide your emotional regulation, helping you decide whether to hold on or let go. Now, let's bring in the investment model by Russ Bilt and others, 1994. This model suggests that commitment isn't just a feeling, it's a calculation, a balance sheet of what you've put in and what you're getting out. In a demanding job or a rigorous academic program, you've invested time, energy, and maybe even your sanity. The context here is your long-term goals, your career trajectory, or your academic ambitions. If the context promises a high return on investment, then holding on isn't just virtuous, it's smart. Southwick and others, 2014, discuss resilience as an interdisciplinary concept, emphasizing that it's not just about bouncing back, but also about growing through adversity. The context here could be a life-altering event or a series of challenges that test your mettle. Holding on, in this case, is not about enduring suffering, but about transforming it into a catalyst for growth. Arks and Bloomer, 1985, introduced us to the psychology of sunk costs, cautioning us against holding on just because we've invested resources into something. But context matters here too. Is it a sunk cost, or is it a down payment on a future that's just within reach? Context helps you differentiate between a futile endeavor and a future success story. Bulin and Len Farrick in 2020 explore the complexities of grief in a context where letting go seems almost mandatory. But even here, context is king. Is it a loss that has fundamentally changed your life's landscape? Or is it a transformative experience that will eventually lead to a new form of existence? Bronfenbrenner in 1996 takes us through the ecology of human development, reminding us that our decisions are not made in a vacuum, but are influenced by various systems around us. Context here could be cultural, social, or even generational. What might be considered holding on in one culture might be seen as a healthy form of persistence in another. Finkel and others in 2017 and Fletcher and Sarker in 2013 both dive into the psychology of relationships and resilience, respectively. They remind us that the context in which we evaluate our commitment and resilience is often framed by our closest relationship and our mental fortitude. Finally, Cretanor and Jia in 2013 take us on a cross-cultural journey exploring how moral emotions are shaped differently depending on cultural context. What's considered morally right in one context might be frowned upon in another. So, dear listeners, the next time you find yourself at the crossroads of holding on and letting go, remember, context isn't just a backdrop. It's the lens through which you view your choices. Choose wisely. The value of resilience. Now, let's talk about resilience. Ah, uh, yes, a mere buzzword for many. True resilience is that elusive elixir that turns life's lemons into a cocktail of experience, wisdom, and grit. It's not just about bouncing back. 
It's about bouncing forward, propelled by the very challenges that sought to bring you down. Picture yourself as a blade of grass, bending under the weight of a storm but never breaking. That's resilience for you. Let's dive into the academic waters for a moment. Fletcher and Sakar in 2013 offer a comprehensive review of what psychological resilience really means. They argue that resilience isn't just a static trait you're born with. It's a dynamic process. It's not a shield that makes you invulnerable, but more like a well-tuned engine that helps you navigate the rocky terrains of life. You build resilience through a combination of personal attributes, coping strategies, and social support. So when you're faced with the decision to hold on or let go, consider what you stand to gain in terms of resilience. Will holding on make you stronger, wiser, more capable, or will it drain the very resilience you've worked so hard to build? Now let's add another layer to this. Southwick and others in 2014 take an interdisciplinary approach to resilience, weaving together perspectives from psychology, trauma studies, and even military science. They emphasize that resilience is not a one-size-fits-all concept. It varies depending on the individual, the challenge, and yes, the context. In military training, for instance, resilience is often built through rigorous physical and mental exercises designed to prepare you for the harshest of conditions. It's about holding on when every fiber of your being screams to let go. In mental health counseling, resilience might be nurtured through cognitive behavioral techniques, mindfulness, or even medication. Here, the focus is on equipping you with the tools to hold on when it's beneficial and let go when it's detrimental. So what's the takeaway? Resilience is not just a buzzword. It's a complex interplay of factors that equip you to face life's challenges head on. When you're at that fork at the road, pondering whether to hold on or let go, think about resilience as your North Star. Will your choice add another layer of resilience to your life, or will it chip away at the resilience you've already built? Remember, resilience isn't just about surviving the storm. It's about learning to dance in the rain, even when the dance floor is slippery and the music is a cacophony of thunder and lightning. Relational commitment, real love versus romantic love. Ah, love, that intoxicating blend of passion, commitment, and intimacy. It's a dance, sometimes graceful, sometimes awkward, but always deeply human. And let's not confuse the fireworks of romantic love with the steady flame of real love. Romantic love is the spark, the initial attraction, the chemical cocktail that makes your heart race. Real love, on the other hand, is what remains when that spark has settled into a warm, enduring glow. It's the commitment to work through challenges, to grow together, and to build something that lasts. Let's dive into the scholarly realm for a moment. Finkel, Simpson, and Eastwick in 2017 outline 14 core principles that govern close relationships. One of these principles is the idea of responsive support, the notion that partners in a committed relationship provide emotional and practical support in a manner that is attuned to each other's needs. This is where real love shines. When you're faced with the decision to hold on or let go in a relationship, consider whether you and your partner offer this kind of responsive support. If the answer is yes, then holding on and working through challenges can deepen emotional bonds and strengthen the partnership. Now let's add another layer of complexity with the investment model by Russ Bilt and others in 1994. This model suggests that commitment in a relationship is influenced by three main factors, satisfaction level, quality of alternatives, and investment size. In simple terms, are you happy? Do you truly have better options? And what have you invested in the relationship? When you're at a crossroads, these are the questions to ask. If you find that you're generally satisfied, that the alternatives are not necessarily better, and that you've invested significantly in the relationship, then perhaps holding on is the wiser choice. Of course, if you discover you're entangled with a genuine narcissist, it's crucial to disengage swiftly. What you're experiencing isn't love for the person, but rather an attachment to a carefully constructed and fragile facade that lacks both substance and authenticity, something they will show you by their actions. True narcissists aside, here's the kicker. Commitment is not a one-way street. Both partners must be invested for the relationship to thrive. If only one person is holding on while the other person has let go, then the relationship becomes a tug of war with no winners. In such cases, letting go might ironically be the more loving act from the one who committed, painful as it may be. Keep in mind that if someone chooses to walk away, 
failing to grasp the significance of life's brevity and the principles of synergy and interdependence, the loss is ultimately theirs. You will continue to attract individuals who recognize and appreciate your intrinsic value. In contrast, they may find themselves surrounded by people who are drawn to a superficial image that can't be sustained indefinitely. Over time, the facade will crumble, revealing their lack of depth and resilience. So, dear listeners, when you find yourself questioning whether to hold on or let go in a relationship, remember that love is not just a feeling. It's a choice, a commitment, a journey. It's about knowing when to hold on tight and when to realize when the one who walks away isn't worth it, when you have so much more to offer than they could ever feel, that the concept of synergy is lost on them. It's about understanding that real love is not about possession. It's about partnership. And that sometimes the most loving thing you can do is hold on through the storms, knowing that the sun will shine again, brighter than ever, on a love that stood the test of time. The sunk cost fallacy versus strategic investment. Ah yes, the sunk cost fallacy, that seductive trap that lures us into throwing good money after bad, good time after wasted, and good emotions into a black hole. It's the psychological quagmire that convinces us to stick with a losing bet just because we've already invested so much. It's like continuing to dig when you're already in a hole, hoping that somehow you'll find a way out, but only getting deeper in. Let's take a scholarly detour for a moment. Marx and Bloomer in 1995 delve into the psychology of sunk costs, explaining how this fallacy can influence not just financial decisions, but also personal and emotional investments. They argue that the sunk cost fallacy often stems from a fear of waste. We're wired to abhor a loss, and this aversion can cloud our judgment making us hold on when letting go would be the rational choice. So when you find yourself clinging to a situation, relationship, or endeavor just because you've already invested in it, pause and ask yourself, am I falling for the sunk cost fallacy? But let's not throw the baby out with the bathwater. There's a fine line between the sunk cost fallacy and what we call strategic investment. Strategic investment is when you consciously decide to invest more resources, be it time, money, or emotional energy, because you believe that the payoff will be worth it. It's not just about recouping lost costs, it's about achieving future gain. That's the sweat you pour into training for a marathon, the late nights you spend building a business, or the emotional labor you've invested in a relationship that you believe has a future. The key difference between the two is foresight and rationale. In strategic investment, you're looking forward, guided by a well-thought-out plan or a deeply held belief that your investment will yield positive returns. In the sunk cause fallacy, you're looking backward, held hostage by what you've already lost or spent. So the next time you're wrestling with the decision to hold on or let go, consider whether you're being guided by the rearview mirror of sunk cost or the looking forward GPS of strategic investment. Are you sticking it out for the promise of a brighter future? Or are you clinging to the past, unable to let go of what's already been lost? The answer to this question could make all the difference in navigating the complex train of life's choices. Ethical and moral consideration. Ah yes, ethics and morals. Those guiding stars that help us navigate the murky waters of life's dilemmas. They're the unwritten rules, the silent whispers, the invisible handshakes that govern our interactions with the world and with ourselves. When the path is shrouded in fog and the signposts are missing, it's our ethical and moral compass that points the way. Let's take a scholarly pause here. Kratzenuer and Gia in 2013 explore the role of moral emotion expectancies across different cultures, specifically comparing Chinese and Canadian adolescents. Their research suggests that moral considerations are not universal, but are shaped by culture, social, and individual factors. This is crucial when we consider the ethics of holding on or letting go. What may be a moral obligation in one culture or context might not hold the same weight in another. So when you're faced with a decision to hold on or let go, consider the broader ethical landscape. Are there cultural or social norms that influence what is considered the right thing to do? Now let's get specific. There are situations where holding on isn't just a matter of personal choice, but a moral imperative. Consider a parent navigating the tumultuous waters of adolescence with their child. The emotional and psychological roller coaster can be draining, but the ethical obligation to provide unwavering support is clear. Or think about caring for an ailing family member. The emotional, physical, and even financial toll can be immense, but the moral compass points towards duty, compassion, and long-term commitment. But here's the rub. Ethical and moral considerations are not blank checks for self-sacrifice. 
there's a fine line between fulfilling a moral obligation and losing oneself in the process. The ethics of care, for instance, emphasize not just caring for others, but also caring for oneself. So when you're holding on because you feel it's the ethical thing to do, don't forget to ask, what's the cost to me, and is it a cost I'm willing and able to bear? In the end, the decision to hold on or let go is often a complex interplay of emotional, rational, and ethical considerations. It's a decision that requires not just the mind, but also the heart and soul. And sometimes, it's a decision that transcends the individual, touching the lives of those around us in ways we may never fully understand. The complexity of human emotion. Ah yes, the intricate tapestry of human emotion, a labyrinthian maze where every turn can either lead to a dead end or open a new pathway. It's a realm where labels like holding on and letting go can quickly lose their meaning, swallowed up by the complexities of our inner world. Let's take a scholarly detour, shall we? Gross and Thompson, 2007, delve into the concept of emotional regulation, exploring how we manage, experience, and respond to emotional states. They argue that emotion regulation is not a one-size-fits-all process, but a nuanced interplay of cognitive, behavioral, and physiological mechanisms. This is crucial when we're wrestling with the decision to hold on or let go. Sometimes what appears to be holding on is actually a sophisticated form of emotion regulation, a way to cope, heal, or even grow. Now let's add another layer to this emotional puzzle with the work of Bo Ellen and Len Fierick, 2020. They examine the diagnostic criteria for disturbed grief, highlighting the complexity of emotional responses to loss and trauma. Their research underscores the idea that mental health is not a linear journey, but a complex landscape with its own peaks and valleys. Sometimes, the path to healing involves holding on, facing challenges head-on, and navigating through the emotional storm, rather than seeking the shelter of letting go. But here's the kicker. The complexity of human emotion means that there's no universal roadmap, no GPS that can guide us towards every twist and turn. What works for one person may not work for another. Holding on might be a form of resilience for some, but a form of self-sabotage for others. The key is self-awareness. The ability to tune into your emotional landscape and discern whether you're holding on out of strength or out of fear, whether you're growing or stagnating. While self-awareness is key, it's important to acknowledge that for some, reaching this level of understanding can be incredibly challenging, if not a nearly impossible task. So as you navigate the complexities of your emotional world, remember that the decision to hold on or let go is really straightforward. It's a decision that requires emotional intelligence, self-awareness, and sometimes the courage to venture into the unknown territories of your inner world. And sometimes it's a decision that defies logic, that transcends rationality, and that speaks to the deepest, most mysterious parts of who we are. And there we have it, folks. We've journeyed through the intricate landscape of holding on and letting go, exploring the nooks and crannies where reason, emotion, ethics, and even cultural nuances come into play. We've seen that the decision to hold on or let go is rarely a simple one. It's a complex tapestry woven from the threads of our experiences, our values, and our emotional and intellectual heights. As we wrap up today's episode, I invite you to take a moment to reflect on your own life. Where are you holding on and where are you letting go? Are your choices driven by resilience or fear, by ethical obligations or emotional complexities? And most importantly, are these choices serving you well? Remember, life doesn't come with a manual. It's a series of choices, a labyrinth of decisions that define who we are and who we become. And sometimes, the most courageous choice is to venture into the unknown, whether that means holding on when everyone else is letting go or letting go when everyone else is holding on. Thank you for joining me on this intellectual and emotional journey. Until next time, keep questioning, keep exploring, and most importantly, keep living authentically. Because at the end of the day, the best compass is your own, and you are the only one who has to live with your choices, good or bad. Remember folks, the truth may take years, even decades, but it always comes out at the end. Good luck out there.